was listening to the song Mad World, and that's kind of the thing I had heard it for the first time. And it would just perfectly encapsulated my feelings at the time. Um, like, and that was one of the ways I did a cry for help before I was truly ready to die, was I just wrote as a Facebook status a lyric from the song. I find it kind of funny, I find it kind of sad. The dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had. I have a memory of exactly where I was sitting and how I was sitting and where I was. Um, I was in, in second year um, of medical school in Montreal. Um, I, I don't remember the specifics of the conversa of the text conversation that we had, but I remember that my, uh, my parents were out of town at the time. Um, Mitch was uh, at home with only the, the housekeeper uh, there, uh, and he messaged me that he had taken uh, his pills. Um, and I initially had, uh, you know, I thought that he took his pills and he's going, you know, to bed for the night and that was it. Um, but then he clarified that he, he took all of them, everything that he had. Um. I, I didn't think that there would be any way for me to survive. I wasn't aware of all these methods they have to keep someone alive who does something like that. I thought I t took all these pills, no one can help me in time. So no matter what happens, I'll be dead soon. My first instinct at that time was actually to figure out, well, you know, it'll be important to know what he actually took. And so I was asking him for, like, what were the medications, how much, and trying to get that information. I messaged him saying what I did, not because I wanted him to save me. I didn't think he could save me, but because I didn't want to die alone. Mitch being delivered. <laughs> that was a pretty early memory, and uh, he seemed like any other happy, well, he was crying at the time, <laughs> but he, he was like a typical baby, and um, he was um, into sports too somewhat, um, although not as much as, as I was. I was always very into sports, so I encouraged my kids to, uh, to play as well, and uh, he enjoyed it, and he played a lot of hockey and he really enjoyed skiing a lot. Those were his two uh, bigger sports. He was born with a lot, a lot of hair. He needed a haircut like the day he was born. Um, but he was always a um, very sensitive, interesting kid. Sort of people described him as uh, one of those babies that were like a little old man. Very fussy with his food. Uh, didn't like the taste of things. His clothing had to be loose. Um, it had to be soft. I had to cut all the labels out of his clothing because it irritated him and he would take it off. Even though his two older brothers wore the exact same sweatshirt and the tag didn't bother them, I had to take it off of Mitch. Socks, he was very fussy about anything that touched his skin. I'd say that looking back uh, to the earliest memories, I see Mitch as a energetic guy, looked a lot like me. In fact, at my bar mitzvah, they put a picture of him by accident on the Simon board because um, we look very similar. So I always related to him in a way uh, that I couldn't really relate to anybody else. It was a different level because uh, I, I saw us as very similar, not just in appearance, but also in uh, personalities in a lot of ways, especially back then. You know, being the little sister, you tend to be the, the, annoying, uh, um, the annoying one. And, you know, there was always some tension when he was playing on the computer, then I'd want to play on the computer, and if he was watching TV, then I'd want to watch TV, which I'm sure he found very annoying. Mitch was very susceptible to uh, reverse psychology uh, when he was younger. So I, I'm about uh, uh, seven years older than Mitch, um, so I, uh, I remember he, he very much liked to try to, you know, go against authority, and if you told him to do something, he wanted to do the opposite. So if I would say, I distinctly remember there being times where, you know, we'd be going out and I'd say to Mitch, like, whatever you do, do not bring me my shoes. Do not bring them to me. And then he would get this devilish grin, run off and bring me the shoes and uh, come on back. Uh, and it took, it took a couple of years before he caught on to that one. Out of four kids, he was the one that cried the most until he was six months old and whatever was bothering him just suddenly disappeared. 
and it was uh, the first time he slept through the night. And I remember going in, I was nervous because he, it was the first time he hadn't woke me up at night in six months. And I thought maybe something terrible happened. And I went in and he was fine. And he uh, basically almost never cried again unless he had a good reason. I guess the absolute turning point was when he became ill at around, I think it was 11 years of age. He it was uh, endemic in, uh, in Toronto. He, uh, the swine flu, H1N1 virus was going around and it was going around in his school and he acquired it as well and became quite ill. I was sick for three weeks and um, basically I got those full body pains you get when you have the flu, except mine were extra severe and uh, they didn't go away ever. He was always a good student and he always did well. And he kept going to school for half a day and I would pick him up. Um, sometimes he didn't go, sometimes he went late, sometimes he left early and, you know, doing the rounds of the doctors. I'd force myself to go to school and then I'd fall asleep in class. I'd force myself to go to school and then I'd faint in class and be driven to the hospital in an ambulance. And I'd force myself to go to school and I'd lose all these friendships because I was so exhausted all the time and um, it was hard to see that happening because this happened just as I was going into high school and um, I'd had all these friends I'd had since nursery and also half the school is new people that you're supposed to be making friends with and I kind of kept those old relationships going for quite a while but wasn't able to really connect with any of the new people, which is half the school, just because they just see someone acting very strange, falling asleep in class, and they didn't know me uh, like how I was before. I felt somewhat responsible to try and figure out what, what was going wrong, um, um, and I was unsuccessful, uh, as were the doctors. But I know that I can't be the one making the diagnosis. I'm a physician, but I'm, I'm his father, so I'm, I, I, don't want to get, I didn't want to get too involved emotionally as it would cloud how to think about it and how to come up with the proper diagnosis. So we were taking to what we thought were the best doctors to come up with the diagnosis. At first we thought it was something called myositis, which is when you get inflammation as a result of being sick. Like the infl your body does get inflamed when you're sick and then that basically means that you stay inflamed long after the sickness went away. That was the first thing we thought was wrong. And then when I had tests done, they showed that I did have high inflammation levels, but then I had tests done again and the levels were normal and my pain wasn't any better. So that's when we got to the next diagnosis, which is post-viral neuralgia. And the problem with that is we did all these tests, and like neurological tests, and they were all negative. We were all being told by, uh, by the doctors that the pain he's feeling is due to a, a mental issue um, and that if we can fix the underlying mental issue that the pain would subside. Um, and so I, I was scrambling to try to like coordinate with my family. How can we, how can we you know, find a creative way to have them snap out of this? Well, when you have pain, it affects you mentally. So, um, you know, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a mental illness, um, but I would definitely call it um, an emotional and mental challenge. We didn't know it, uh, at the time, again, that he had the, the wrong diagnosis, but even if it was a psychiatric disorder, it's still something that needs to be dealt with. And uh, the fact that it was not being dealt with well in that he was still quite ill and suffering that was the most frustrating part seeing uh your your child in pain and uncomfortable i'm not criticizing the psychiatrists either they were working with the inf working diagnosis at the time and they were doing the best they could everyone had good intentions but the fact was he wasn't getting good results so that was a very frustrating time for him and for me
we had um, a woman who worked for us who was staying in the house with Mitch, and Mitch um, posted something on social media that my friend who was also looking after him and that she right away uh, came over. I started feeling hopeless and I had good reason to think things were hopeless because if everyone kept insisting on the crazy thing, then how are they going to treat what's really wrong with me? I didn't know what was really wrong with me, I just was very certain it was something physical. So I took a week's worth of pills. That was incredibly difficult. Um, just because I wasn't there. And even though I now realize like I was just a little kid, like of course there was nothing I could have done to change it. But I, like me and my parents were in on a, my dad had a conference in Mexico, so we were away. And I just felt like I should have been there. It was a bit of a, an eye-opener from the perspective that uh, he was that deeply bothered and, and, and felt so frustrated that he felt the need to, to attempt suicide. So um, it, it, it was a very obviously difficult thing to go through. And uh, it just brought to light a little bit uh, the level of his uh, uh, depression and sadness and frustration. I was put in a, this like psych hospital thing for a week and nothing helped at like, I had talked to this guy who just didn't understand me at all. And then I was discharged after a week and literally nothing improved at all. Um, I probably said, yeah, I'm feeling better just because I wanted to leave. What was going on in my head was trying to figure out how I could determine what was going on and I do things that, in retrospect, seem very silly. I do things like um, run around the block, sprinting, over and over again, and that's one of the most painful things I could possibly do. And for weeks after I did that, I was in extra pain. Um, and I did that because I started to doubt myself. It's painful to think about how isolating that must have been for Mitch in that time to, you're dealing with the issues, and then on top of that, you're having people that are telling you just to get over it and all that. To hear people call him lazy of all things, like if there's anything he isn't, it's lazy. And it's just that he's in incredible pain that it's debilitating, like so debilitating. And I have spent years trying to imagine like what that must feel like, and it's Im impossible. No one who doesn't experience chronic pain can ever imagine what that would do, but I just, it, oh, it gets under my skin when people think he's um, over-exaggerating or it's just a way to get out of things or anything like that because it's the exact opposite. It's the furthest from the truth you could be. I don't know if you know the term gaslighting, but it's when someone keeps insisting something so often and with such conviction that you start to wonder, maybe they're right, maybe I'm just crazy. So I thought, okay, maybe I can just get my legs strong enough and then the pain will go away. So that's why I just keep running and running and running until I was in so much pain that I was crying and screaming. And um, of course, that just made things worse instead of helping, but that's just how desperate and clueless I was. It's easier for people to say, oh, he's lazy or, oh, he's not trying hard enough because then that means it's like hit up to him. It's not bad luck that he's just had this condition or whatever. It, it is something we can control and people want to believe that every situation they'd have control and, oh, if I had that, I could like just push through it and it wouldn't be a problem, but it's just not true. None of us can actually have control over our situations and, um, Mitch is truly in a situation where he, it's not a thing he can control. It is now 4.15 a.m. I have just tried to go to bed after taking all my medications. 
Oh yeah, once we get to the peak of all the medication, I'm at my most tired, and once that period passes, I'm screwed the entire night like this. Uh, because they wear off so quickly that once they reach their peak, you have, if, if you're not asleep, by the last 20 minutes or first, no, by your first 20 minutes after taking your last medication, then, then you're screwed for the rest of the night and that means you're screwed for the rest of the day. I was prescribed morphine and the reason everything was worse is, first of all, it didn't help with the pain and it turned me into a completely different person, like some sort of zombie who never smiled, who never laughed, uh, which is the opposite of how I describe old Mitch. And uh, since it didn't help and made me even more miserable, I used it in an overdose to try to kill myself again. Except this time I didn't tell anyone, I didn't tell my brother because I didn't want to make the same mistake I made the first time. So I locked myself in my bathroom while I was home alone and slumped against the wall and actually had a smile on my face because my pain finally <laughs> was going away. And so was I. And as everything go, went to black, I was smiling and then don't remember anything that happened after that. Well, that was probably the most difficult time of my life because um, he was close. He uh, almost was successful. And um, just to know that you have a child that was feeling so ill that they wanted to end it was obviously very, very frustrating and difficult. Um, yeah, when he woke up in the ICU, He was, sorry. Yeah, he was crying because he was unsuccessful. I think that the hardest thing is when your kid tells you that he thinks you'd be better off without him. That is the hardest thing for a parent to hear. And I think that, um, most kids, especially teenagers, I think that um, they don't realize how much their parents care. I promised everyone around me, because they asked that I do this, that if I'm ever feeling that way, that I'm actually making plans, I will tell them. And I'm gonna stick to that promise. And um, I wouldn't say I'm actively suicidal, but I would say that I have a very different view of death. Uh, I don't want to kill myself, but I also just wish I never existed a lot of the time, because then I wouldn't be hurting anyone if I was gone. And that's the guilt I feel is less about the attempt I made and more about the harm I would cause if I succeeded in doing that. You don't want to be in a psych ward ever, unwillingly, of course, especially. And you also don't want to be in a psych ward when you're going through morphine withdrawal and no one really knows what to make of you because you're still undiagnosed and everything. We were not allowed or had very limited interactions with them. We were only allowed certain phone calls during certain times and we could only visit for a certain period of time. And that gradually increased as, as they felt he was getting better, but um, that was, you know, very difficult because you want to be be there as a parent for your kid and you couldn't physically be there or emotionally be there as much as you wanted to. It was a bit surreal hearing, you know, just some of the, the discussion around um, psychiatric care relating to Mitch kind of at that time. Um, I remember Mitch while in the hospital was, um, uh, uh, well, he, he was 
very depressed. He was in a bad mental state. It was decided I, sh I shouldn't see him. Um, and I understand why now, you know, as an adult who um, can only imagine like how traumatizing that would be for a little kid to go see their big brother in a psych ward. But um, at the time, again, it was just like, if only I could be there. And I just was so convinced that I could change something because it was so hard to accept that I had no power. And it's still hard to accept. Mitchell, you want to do some dancing, Mitchie? Yeah? Okay, what do you want to listen? What music should we put on? You want CD? Say CD. So I think you have to also realize that there were a few times where doctors thought they had a diagnosis and it turned out to not be. So I learned very early on not to get too excited about anything and maybe sometimes Mitch felt disappointment because he always got very excited when somebody would suggest exploring something. But when Mitch saw, I think, believe a neurologist who noticed that Mitch was doing funny things with his fingers. He noticed me cracking my joints all the time. As I stood up to leave, I was heartbroken because he said, sorry, can't help you. All the tests are negative. You don't have a neurological problem. And as I get up, all my joints are cracking. So he asked me a bunch of questions. Do you do that often? Then all these other questions, how flexible are you, all these things? And um, he started going, hmm, so sorry, I need to leave now because I have my next patient. But look up Ehlers-Danlos syndrome when you get home. So in the car ride home, I was going home with my dad. We started looking, Google searching my new clinical diagnosis, and it explained everything. All of my symptoms, not even just my current symptoms, but all these weird things that happened in my childhood. They felt quite certain then, um, but I was still, we'll wait and see. And they sent Mitch for a biopsy. So to actually look at his skin to see if the cells are deformed, because it's, his skin is very, um, they, ha they tend to have very, um, like a baby, you know, smooth skin and, and very stretchy skin. Like instead of doing this, you can stretch your skin all out. It's very elastic. And when the results came back, they said he, it was so classic, it was totally definitive, that his cells, instead of being sort of smooth on the um, periphery, the membrane of the cells, it's like cauliflower, it's all a little bumpy all around. And that's because uh, he's missing some kind of protein or the po proteins are in the wrong balance or whatever. And so his cells for his skin and connective tissue and, and it makes it weak. So at that point, that's when I knew. Yeah, well, it was um, a bit of mixed feelings because um, I felt great that I knew he was right when he said that everything fit, everything made sense. All his previous uh, medical problems, their hernias, the, the recurrent hernia, um, everything made complete sense. So I was sure that was the, the right diagnosis. Uh, the, the negative side of it, though, is that it's, it's an incurable progressive disease. So it's not, it wasn't great news from that perspective. But to finally know, and uh, it, it sort of was extremely validating for Mitch because it, every, Everyone that was telling him, this is in your head, and he did not feel it was in his head, that he was correct. Well, I was extremely happy, actually. And it's, it's pretty unusual for someone being diagnosed with something with no cure, with um, no real treatments even, to actually do much. But it was way better than being called crazy, because now everyone started believing me, and that's when I stopped becoming actively suicidal is when I started getting the treatment that I deserved and not being doubted and all these different things. And uh, the most important thing that changed was I could go meet other people who had this condition because before I was going through it completely alone in that I had no one I could relate to. And so I immediately started going to these support groups 
of other people with EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. EDS Canada, as I said, was formed in 2013. And the mission and vision was very simple. Um, it was to provide knowledge and advocacy for individuals suffering with EDS and their families. And it was to engage policymakers to make the much needed change that we would, you know, like to see in our medical community. What, since I was the first male to go to these groups, uh, Kathleen had the idea for me to be the leader of a specific online support group on Facebook just for men with the disease because the, um, <laughs> the normal groups are almost just for women just because it's 99% women. I was living with um, chronic pain and uh, for about seven years I was looking for um, a root cause of, of my pain and in 2009 um, I was diagnosed, clinically diagnosed, with hypermobility. That's what they used to call it at the time. Fortunately for me, my brother and two of his kids, unfortunately, you could say, uh, were diagnosed before me. So when I um, had some complications following the birth of my daughter, um, I was officially diagnosed. Um, though I had I figured that I did have EDS based on my limited knowledge of it. When I first got diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos, I was a student with, you know, who was achieving like the highest grades. I was in many advanced placement classes. I wanted to be a nurse. I was going to go to, you know, an advanced placement nursing school, um, and that was my dream, and all of my dreams were crushed, you know? I, I got very sick very, very fast, and I went from having everything to having nothing. I know that if I had been diagnosed as a kid, um, things would maybe be different. Maybe I would have more mobility in my hands because when you are when you have EDS as a child versus EDS as a 50-year-old, those symptoms look a lot different. EDS has um, classified as 13 different subtypes. The most prevalent is hypermobility or HSD, uh, which is a spectrum, hypermobility spectrum disorder. And those are the two branches, but the majority of people rest in there. Um, the main thing is being hypermobile, being very flexible. Like one of the tests is can your thumb touch your arm here? And mine can. And um, a lot of people, if you can do that, that doesn't mean you have EDS. It's just one of the kind of requirements. Um, you can be hypermobile and be otherwise healthy, but with EDS you often get joint pain, and that's what I have, which covers all of my legs. For many years, when I would go for medical appointments and I would give, you know, medical history, I would say, well, I have EDS, and I can't count the number of doctors who would say, what's that? I think that in the past, uh, very little has been done in that training stage where doctors are being trained in regards to pain management, pain conditions, chronic pain, as well as more of the rare conditions. And I think that doctors traditionally have relied on geneticists and genetic consultations to try and, you know, piece this stuff out and take a look at it. Um, can I blame the system for not doing it fast enough? Maybe. But there's several factors that come into play when we're talking about it, because we ourselves, you know, may not, you know, we have a migraine, we have some dental issues, a little bit of back pain early on, you name it. Uh, you've got maybe one knee or one elbow and we go from doctor to doctor, um, there's not sort of one specialist, you know, that can say, hey, look, maybe this is something deeper. Maybe this is, you know, a rare genetic condition, which is what Ehlers-Danlos is. My entire life, I had people questioning me, even still, because my disability is very invisible. People have no idea what I go through. Like, I use a wheelchair and, people don't believe me, you know? So either I'm in the wheelchair and they don't believe I can walk, or they think I'm more disabled than I actually am, or 
I'm not disabled enough. So it's always that fluctuation of finding the happy medium of getting people to understand what I'm truly going through. And people have a standard and they think that you have to meet that standard in order for them to accept your disability, for them to accept um, where you are. Because some days I can run, some days I can do hikes. Like I, I live a full and normal life sometimes. Most of the time I spend, you know, time sitting in bed, you know, resting. I have to take a lot of time to recuperate myself. I have to take a lot of medication, but people don't see that aspect of my life. They, it's all behind closed doors. And you know, when people want to conceptualize disability, seeing is believing. We've had reports galore all the time of people really suffering from this kind of attitude from others. And it can be family members, um, family members, employers, longtime friends. And, uh, you know, one day, you know, you look great and you, well, let's take me for instance, since you, you were yeah. sort of wanting to, you know, I tried very hard today uh, to, to come and to look presentable, um, to remain upright, much like the rest of us and to do a good job here at the interview. And um, what you're not seeing is the excruciating neck and back pain Doesn't and the fatigue. And when I go home, I'm going to crash and I won't be able to do the things around the household that I normally would, would do. And I might, it might be a couple of days before I recover. But I'm willing to do that because it's important and my brain, that's the way I work. I'll push through because I, you know, there's just, I want to be able to fight for those who can't. So when my mother was elected as a member of a provincial parliament here, uh, we kind of came up with the idea to kind of make use of that in our cause. So I connected with those people who I had met from the support groups I mentioned earlier and got them in on it. And all together, uh, the three entities, me, my mom, and these groups of other people with Ellers Danlos, so wrote a speech, and then we all together there was like a group of like um, 16 of us. We went to Queen's Park, the legislature, and uh, my mom gave the speech that we wrote together. Um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, is a genetic disorder involving mutations in connective tissue characterized by instability and dislocations of the joints. Skin that bruises, scars, and tears easily, arterial and organ rupture causing internal bleeding, shock, stroke, and premature death. There is neither routine screening nor a cure for EDS. Early and accurate diagnosis can provide opportunities for life-saving emergency medical plans and proper monitoring and improve quality of life. And two months after that, the government announced the opening of the very first clinic in Canada for treating this specific condition at Toronto General Hospital. And then I became one of the first patients there. And the people who came with me to Parliament, the people with EDS, they give me some of the credit for that clinic opening in the first place because it seemed like it'd be like um, a longer road than that and then we got almost immediate results and so it's really cool to see such tangible results from your hard work.
Do we know how to sing everybody in Backstreet's back? You know, we all are dealt a deck of cards and um, you don't know what hand you're going to get and you just have to make the best of your situation. It's, it's all about how you perceive your hand and uh, you can have two people with the same hand and they'll look at life completely differently. Uh, I, I never looked at it as why me, why us, why Mitch, why the family. Um, it's always whatever you get is what you've got and you have to make the best of that situation. Yes? Were you sleeping with your eyes open? Yes? Do you feel better now? You want to watch? You want to show something? Are you allowed outside in your shoes? Without your shoes? What do you want to show me? Years old, I was finally diagnosed with hypermobile type Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Like many, I rely on a lot of bracing, um, splints, and mobility aids to help me go about my day. The thing is, when we take our braces and splints off, and when we are not using our mobility aids, our disabilities become invisible and people have no idea just how much we're suffering or that EDS has so much that goes along with it and is not just hypermobility. Hi there, my name is Reagan and I am currently awaiting an appointment with the EDS clinic at SickKids in Toronto for an official EDS diagnosis. Managing my illness can be difficult at times, but I find the best way to manage it and deal with it is through exercise. I'm a high level competitive cheerleader, and I find that even though exercise can be painful at times, it also helps relieve my pain. Hi, I'm Shruti Chopra. I live in Mumbai, India. I was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS in 2017. In India, it's not common to see people with visible disabilities socializing in cafes and restaurants, so people have a habit to stop and stare. If the city consciously develops better accessibility, then we may see more people like me feeling more confident to step out. Hi, my name is Ashley. I'm 35 years old and I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I was diagnosed in 2010 with hypermobile EDS. Um, I try to manage my EDS by staying positive, keeping busy. Um, as many know, it's a full-time job. Um, I'm stuck in bed at least every second day. Uh, so I like to keep positive and do things that make me smile on the days that I can. Hi, my name is Toria Somerville and I'm the contortionist here in Bender Break. It's suspected that I have multiple subtypes of EDS, however, I'm still waiting on a formal diagnosis to receive proper treatment. I have been incredibly hypermobile since I was a kid, and for years, I've been dealing with all the classic symptoms, such as joint dislocations, chronic pain, fragile skin, GI issues, learning disabilities, you name it. I'm now 21 years old, and finally on an 18 month wait list to see a geneticist to get my formal diagnosis. In this day and age, luckily there's so much more knowledge and access to information about EDS. Not to mention all of the wonderfully supportive communities filled with people who are on this journey with you, reminding you that you are not alone.